Welcome to We Read For You at the University of Stellenbosch Business School Executive Development. My name is Chris van der Hoven and today what we looked at was Performance at the Limit, Business Lessons from Formula One Motor Racing. The authors are Mark Jenkins, Ken Pasternak and Richard West. And a short version of, edited version of this video follows. The original book, this is the third edition, the original book was based on 95 top level interviews, uh, 15 Grand Prix team facility visits, uh, four Grand Prix attendances and since then they've stopped recording the number of interviews that they've done and how many f facility visits and so on because it's become kind of ridiculous. It's got much bigger than it ever was. We did an interview with Mark Jenkins, the principal author, and this was the question. Please say a word about your background, a little bit about your co-author. So Kerry's just going to run this video for us. Mark Jenkins, I'm Professor of Business Strategy at Cranfield School of Management and like most of my colleagues here at Cranfield, um, I came from as, as a practitioner into academia, really then moved into this whole area of strategy and, and the question of why do some organizations consistently outperform others. Uh, we ran this program for many years, uh, often using the Williams facility at Oxford, um, where we got teams of managers to change the wheels and tires on cars and do Formula One sort of simulations and case studies. And uh, it was very successful. The, the firm got a lot out of it. But we felt, well, perhaps there's a book here. So uh, after the, we'd sort of finished the program, the three of us got together and we produced the first edition of the book, which was published in 2005. In the work that we do with executives, it's quite often the case that if we go around the room and say, what is your expectation for the time you will spend with us? People will say, oh, please, can it be practical? Well, that slightly defeats the object of being in the room in the first place because if practice was so perfect, we wouldn't spend time together talking about how do we improve what we're doing. Um, and the idea of these different case studies is to, is to find alternative ways of thinking, paradigms, mindsets that we can deploy into our day-to-day -day work that give us a chance to sort of shake the foundations, shake the tree, if you like. For people like us looking at, at developing knowledge in, about how you run organizations, how you create high performance, there are a number of different ways we can do that. One is we can do benchmarking studies and, you know, firms like Amazon, Netflix and so on are the current heroes, but they're not going to be the heroes in the future. But books like In Search of Excellence, Group to Great, or sort of went down that route and that's fine. Uh, the other route we can take is to look at theory and say, OK, if we use pure theory, can we extrapolate what you need to do in your business to be successful? And Michael Porter has um, done a great job of using basic economic theory to help people think about how they position their firms. But um, I think there's a third way, and that's where this comes in, and that's to look at very unusual situations, not in the sense of saying you need to be like a Formula One team, but in the sense of saying if you look at this really extreme situation, there are learnings that you can take out of this. One of the other things about Formula One is uh, under the regulations, each team has to design and manufacture its own unique car. Yeah. So it's not just a race of drivers going around in circles, it's a race of design, manufacture, logistics, money. If there are 21 races in a season and they are a week or two weeks apart, basically the way it works is like a traveling circus. They, 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 they get all their kit together and they, they go to one venue and then to another and then to another and they pack everything out, they run the race, pack it all up, go to the next venue. Um, and any innovating that happens because of what they see in competition happens while all of this is going on. So it's literally building the, the car as they race it. It's, it's quite remarkable. All right, so let's just go through these various things on the performance pyramid. The first thing is to say they did a study um, which started in the early 1950s and went up to 2017. Basically what this shows is the, the speed, this is not 60,000, 80,000, it's 60, 80, 100, the average speed around a particular circuit. This particular circuit is Monaco. So those of you that follow Formula One will know Monaco is, is a demon. The thing that's quite unbelievable is, so we're talking about roughly at the top end here, an average speed of 180 kilometers an hour around that circuit. Um, and what it shows you is that, that over that period of time, this average speed has just rocketed, okay? Now, what's happening is that in the, in the system, the regulators 
cohabit uh, with the, the actual race teams. And the regulators are constantly moving the goalposts in order to make it interesting for the viewing public, but also to make it relevant as a sport and as an industry. So for example, um, at one stage, uh, around about 2014, uh, there was an adjustment made, you can see a little blip here, where the average uh, engine size was about 2.4 litres and, uh, and the regulators insisted that it couldn't be bigger than 1.6, I think. Actually, what's interesting is then they take that new regulation and they innovate to the point where they're now going faster with a 1.6 litre motor than they ever were going in a 2.4 litre motor. The other thing about focus here, and again I'll come back to it, and my colleagues in the room will laugh at this because they know we call our CFO Sir Frank. <coughs> Uh, Sir Frank is a reference to Sir Frank Williams, who, as you know, is the team principal of Williams Racing. Um, and he, he's quoted in the book around focus, but the one quote that's used more than any other quote is, for any expenditure in the business over 5,000 pounds, he has to sign the check or the sign it off, authorize it. And apparently he's got one question every single time, which is, will this make the car go faster? Now, his point and the general point about this part of the performance pyramid is to translate back into our world is what is the focus of what we are doing? Is it that clear and that simple? The examples uh, that are used by team bosses and chief executives um, in Formula One are they say we have a financial review or a performance review every week or every two weeks. You are literally only as good as the most recent race that you've run. The next thing is about constant learning. And this also links to the winning culture thing in a way that I'll explain in a moment. But in essence, the thing about constant learning is that you can't uh, prevail in an industry like Formula One unless you are scanning around you all the time. In the airline industry, there's an analogy between a pit stop and turning an aircraft around as fast as possible. There's a whole thing about process design and innovating around processes and scripting those processes. So process and performance. So for Toto Wolff, for example, he would say process and performance goes together. And again, you see those kind of quotes in the book quite a lot. How do you operationalize the learning? The examples in these circles don't really matter. It happens to be Formula One, but you can put anything you like as an example of the type of learning that, or the target of the learning, if you like. But they look at the level of the individual, first of all, then the group or the team, and then a multi-group. So this is, for example, I mentioned earlier, Ferrari, the aero package, the chassis and the drivetrain. Um, and then the organization, what can we learn as an organization? Now, for example, in Ed, what we do is, oh, in, there, in the example in the book, which is really nicely done, they literally ask the question, what would you do more of and what would you do less of in each of these levels? What, what we do is we say, what must we stop doing? What must we start doing? What must we keep doing? And one of the things that I would encourage you to do if you're able to use this kind of a model is in the learning process, don't hide behind what you hope will be the outcome because you won't save the organization in the long run if, you, if that's the basis of your decision making about how do we operationalize learning. We have to envisage scenarios of complete and utter annihilation in order to work out what our path is through that process. So I think that what we've got to do is it's about managing expectations but it's also not to assume too strongly one way or the other about what people's preferences are and also to realize different people operate at a different pace. But in the case of Formula One, they talk about the fact that people have to be individuals first, but absolutely team players next. Why? Because they have to have their own point of view. But if that point of view doesn't prevail, then get on board with the team. So I, I think this is really an important thing, is to get the learning locked in and then move to the next opportunity to experiment or to pilot something. Take small bets, keep moving. Um, and then the last part of the performance pyramid is this idea of a winning culture. Um, some of these things are pretty obvious, but some less obvious. The idea of constant communication is in part to do with across silos, across geographies, across different levels in the organization. 
This one here, the no blame philosophy, we've had a lot of fun with in USB Ed. Uh, because people do silly things, and what you want to do is to stomp on them. And uh, what, this is, what this is trying to encourage you to do is to say, just hold on a second. So, I mean, let's take an extreme example. Someone makes a mistake and you fire them. Okay? Where does the learning go once you fire that person? Out the door, right? So now we're just lining ourselves up to make the same mistake again, it'll just be somebody else. The next one is a long-term perspective, and there's a couple of team bosses who've proven this. The McLaren team boss for a while um, was an example of this, where they go, you know, you'll have noticed that McLaren went through a phase where they were seriously underperforming, those of you that follow. And their technical director and the guys at the top just said, just steady as she goes, and eventually we'll get back to where we need to be. And it's proven to be so. For those people in business, we are, we are measured on the top line and the bottom line to, to make it a crude, put it crudely. Um, and that's a 12 month thing. And so we do our budgeting and our forecasting and quarter by quarter we, we monitor those and we put pressure on the organization to do better, etc. And what we should be doing is we should be building the basis on which this organization is sustainable for the medium to long term. And, and that is absolutely the job of the chief executive in the organization, but it's also the job of the most senior leaders. Positive framing is very simply a choice uh, about choosing to be positive. A couple of examples in the book where shareholders or other stakeholders are hammering the team bosses. And the team bosses have got to keep the team in the moment in the race. And for that reason, they actually filter and buffer the messages that come top down. The one team mindset is all about understanding that the customer looks at your business from the point of view of what the value proposition is that you are giving to them. They do not care about your marketing department, your operations department, your this, your that, etc., and how you balance between the whole organization and the rest. What they're interested in is can you do end-to-end Sometimes in a one-stop shop, sometimes in a different configuration, what it is that they are after. So that's, that's the, three, the three different areas. I asked Mark this question as a sort of a takeaway. What is, what is it that people take away from these lessons? So let's hear. To me, it's the pyramid, um, the performance pyramid, uh, which we introduced in the third edition. And these three levels about, it's all about learning, but in order to get the learning, you've got to have those two other factors. One is that clear focus, that sense of purpose. What are we here to do? And the other is we've got to get the culture aligned with what it is we're trying to achieve. And I'm often asked, you know, the, the point that, um, yeah, okay, Formula One teams have got all these amazing resources. You know, they're, yeah, here are we scraping together. You know, we haven't got, we haven't got all the money to do all of this. So what, 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 do you, what can you say to us? And for me, the, the key thing is about reviewing. Uh, this thing that if you constantly review, you do it all the time, then you're constantly looking for ways to improve in everything you do. It doesn't cost anything. It needs a little bit of time, but not a lot of time, just to take that moment after uh, perhaps a meeting with a customer, perhaps a project, just to say, what went well here? What were the things we did well? What were the things that didn't go so well? Perhaps we had a near miss. What are the learnings that we've got to take through to the next time we do this? And that's the other critical bit. One is to do the review, and the next is to make sure that you're taking those learnings forward into that next cycle. It is that mindset of looking always for the learnings, looking always for those things that help you do what you do that little bit better. Um, that, to me, is one of the most powerful. So let me, let me stop there. That is, that's well and truly my, my time up.